You're listening to a podcast from The Word. So, Mark, we've had a busy week, haven't we? We went on a date last Saturday <laughs> evening, didn't we? We went to a gig. <laughs> the, the, and it was a gig with a difference, wasn't it, really? It was uh, It was unlike... It was fabulously like, unrock and roll. It was it? fabulously unrock and roll. In that it started, at, I think, at 7 o'clock in the evening, and it was advertised to last for, for 75 minutes. It lasted for 75 minutes precisely, and then there was an encore... And it was in a, a little venue, part of Zadell Brasserie in uh, Piccadilly Circus. This is very un rock and roll, isn't it? A little venue called the Crazy Cox. And it was the son of Ben Sidron, the great Leo Sidron. It was fantastic. With his little French band playing his wonderful kind of, just, oh, how do you describe it? It's kind of jazz and funk, isn't it? And, you know, just beautiful songs. It was beautiful. It was, it was so such a civilised experience, the whole thing. I booked the tickets a while back. And then when it came uh, to the day of the gig, they sent you an email just reminding you what time it started, which I thought was a very, very nice touch, actually. Yeah. When we got there, I was I was uh, preparing to display the tickets and so forth. They said, no, just give me your name, you know, so they checked your name off the list and then conducted you to your table and your two chairs there. And then a thing a person called a waitress, Mark, a waitress, you probably never come across this before, actually came over Not at a gig. <laughs> and said, would you like a drink? And we ordered a couple of drinks and whatever. And then, amazingly, Leo Sidron came over and said hello to us. He came over, he recognised our picture from the <laughs> yeah. podcast. Yes. We've been talking about his dad's records and how many there were and how they were all still freely available to listen to. And he'd, he'd heard about it and, uh, and started listening to the podcast, which is great. Isn't it? I thought that was a lovely touch, and in future, whenever I go to a gig, I shall expect yeah. the artist to actually make their way from wherever they are yeah. to come to my table, and henceforth it's going to be a table with a couple of drinks on it, and actually welcome me in person. You know, that, that's the minimum I shall expect. Yeah, in the at which future. point you can then say, well, thanks very much, carry on. <laughs> Good luck. You <laughs> now may now be, you can take to the stage. You may begin. Um, we and also Linda Thompson was there. Which we was bumped there. into Linda Thompson, yeah. didn't we? We'd actually only been talking about her. We had uh, shoot out the the lights. I think uh, earlier on the on the podcast we recorded that day, and there she was with a pal going to see Leo Sidron. Very good. and uh, and you got a show coming up at the um, oh what's it called Cadogan Cadogan Hall in Chelsea in the summer. Uh, of other performers doing her songs, which goes under the name of Proxy Music. Proxy Get it? Music. Proxy Music. Very good. So talking of Proxy Music and Roxy Music, the other the second feature of, of the week was uh, we had a word in your ear with Phil Manzanera at 21 Soho. That's our first live event of of this year. And Phil Manzanera talking about his autobiography um, and also playing a couple of tunes. It was rather special, wasn't no, it? No, it was fantastic. Fantastic. He, what a good story and what a good talker. And a key moment in that, I think, which we should mention, is that he made more money when he recorded, didn't he, a guitar figure, a guitar riff, while sitting on a sofa... Uh, or wrote it anyway, I was sitting on a sofa in 1978, lasts about six seconds, and that he had made more money <laughs> from that one piece of recording than he had made in the entire time he'd been in Roxy Music. Wasn't that absolutely amazing? All thanks to the fact that Kanye had ended up on a Kanye West record. Uh, well, which... he'd been rung up, hadn't he, by a representative from the record company saying that we're going to use this track, and... He was very interested about it. And then he sort of said, he rang up the publishers and said, well, this sounds good. There must be some money in it. So we've been talking to them for ages. You'll be very pleased. Absolutely. And the end result was that he got a third, didn't he, of the compositional royalty for the track. And he said it was just like, I can't remember how he described it. I think he said it was like a fruit machine where you pull a lever and it just keeps, and the money keeps on pouring out. Because it had then become, it got onto movie soundtracks, and it? it got onto to, uh, to adverts. It was absolutely amazing. What was it called? No Church in the no Wild. No Church in the Wild. That's it was a huge hit. Yeah. Huge hit. Um, but it's just just goes to show that, um, you know, as he pointed out, that these things can happen to you 
if you stick around long enough, yeah. you know, if you're there to benefit from them when you're in your uh, your seventies or whatever, you know, it's well, money I from home. Because I didn't realise that you know the, 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 there were people there preparing things that could possibly make samples. Oh yeah, yeah. And uh, on this particular track, this guy had chosen ten samples, one of which was this thing by Phil Manzanera. <clears throat> There's also um, uh, <clears throat> "Sunshine Help Me" by Spooky Tooth. And there was a James Brown track, you know, and they just pick those things and say, is there anything you can do with that? And I thought that was amazing how random it all was, that process. Yeah, and so that interview with Phil Manzanero is, uh, is with you now, uh, and he was, he was very good. And his book is very good. It's really interesting. And because he's had a very varied career, you know, started off in, uh, you know, obviously we grew up pretty much in in Cuba in South America, and then came to Britain when he was a when he was a teneager. Um, uh, who else we talked to this week? We talked to Charlene Spiteri. That was interesting because that was the second head former hairdresser we have talked to in just two or three weeks. Susie Ronson, of course, who was Bowie's stylist. Talked for. She was really interesting about that. She said that being a hairdresser. She was a hairdresser when she was a teenager in a, in a salon in Glasgow. She said it was the, the best possible um, kind of apprenticeship, didn't she, for being a pop star? Because it's a very theatrical thing. Mm. You're on, you're performing, you're entertaining, you're sort of on show. And she also chose all the music for the mixtapes that they played in the salon. And uh, she was good value, I thought. Very funny. She was really interesting uh, and... Uh... I thought when she what she told us about John Cougar Mellencamp was particularly, particularly yes. interesting. That Texas had been on tour with uh, John Mellencamp some while back, and in America, and obviously in the sports lot. And her expectation, based on her experience of the music business that far, was that that wouldn't necessarily mean she would ever meet him. You know what I mean? Because this is one of the great... We always tend to think that, you know, the backstage, they're all one big family, whatever it is, you know, and they're all sharing the same canteen and so forth and the same kind of running jokes. But no, they're not. The headliners, in most cases, simply do not meet the support slot. You know, I was reading about recently Lucinda Williams' book. Uh, she goes on tour with uh, Bob Dylan and Van Morrison, doesn't she? She tours yeah. all over America and literally never meets either. Never meets either. Um, There's some group, and I can't remember now who they were, who did go on tour with Dylan and never met him until the last night when obviously his manager had marched him, frog-marched him into their dressing room. And he says, oh, thank you very much, and I'm so glad you came on our tour. All the best, you know. And then about 20 minutes later, apparently, they ran into him again. And he said, well, thanks very much. Uh, so glad that you're on tour. So <laughs> they felt that, that some, of the, some of the shine had gone off that too. Actually. So anyway, in the case of, uh, of Texas and John Mellencamp, he was anything but. He, he turned up on the dressing room door and uh, welcomed them to the tour and so forth. And actually, uh, he said, come and watch the show from the side of the stage. And, uh, and halfway through his act, he kind of danced over to Charlene who was in the wings, and said, do you know pink houses? And she thought, well, I don't really, but in for a penny, in for a pound. And I thought, so she went on stage and sang it with him, which I thought showed amazing nerve, actually, to do that. Incredible kind of nerve, especially yes. in front of all his most ardent supporters. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. Wishing they were doing that themselves and know every syllable of the lyric. Yeah, so she was terrifically good value. That again is is out there or will will be out there soon. And they, here's a good opportunity to point out that if you were a Patreon supporter, you would obviously be able to access all of this uh, before anyone else and in an ad free format. Uh, and you'd also have the warm glow that comes from knowing that you're doing work of national imports. Uh, and uh, so if you want to investigate that, go to patreon.com slash word in your ear. We'll be back in a moment. The Word Podcast, prime cuts of popular culture served fresh each week. And we're back. Dave, is there a record that's had more consequences for more people than Layla, which was recorded 53 years ago? It's astonishing, isn't it? I was just reading this morning that that the auctions happened. You know, Patty Boyd was putting all her various possessions and things up for for sale, and uh, the letters she got from Eric Clapton at the time, and the cover of Layla, the cover artwork itself, 
uh, for the Derek and the Dominoes album are sold for, I think it's one million nine hundred and sixty thousand pounds or something it's absolutely amazing isn't it and it's just such a fascinating story because we talked before about the, the the kind of the love affair the love triangle you know which did overlap slightly i think i got that slightly wrong that actually actually he fell eric fell in love with patty boyd towards the end of the late 60s didn't he and told her and she and, and george harrison discovered him and was kind of upset about it but although george harrison and patty boy's relationship was obviously disintegrating massively at the time so it wasn't until a bit later that they got together and got married i think at the end of the 70s but anyway there's a, a wonderful moment when he played her the original version of the song which is this is com- this completely through her and she just thought i i uh, this this clearly must be my destiny you know but the story of the song is extraordinary isn't it Starts off with him inspired by a 12th century Persian poet. It's just, you know, that, all kinds of things in this story yeah. just make me want to stop and scratch my head. The idea that kind of energetic heterosexual rock star, um, you, you know, in 1969, 70 or whatever, is actually reading 12th century Persian poetry. I find absolutely extraordinary. Yes. Yeah, you know, I can imagine people talking about reading 12th century Persian poetry, but actually doing it, I do not know. And um, the thing that intrigues me about the correspondence with Patty Boyd that was sold as part of this auction in recent times is the idea that there was a time when people actually put pen to paper, wrote wrote letters with really rather good handwriting. And also, yeah, but also they're very considered, aren't they? Because very now considered. if you're sending a text, you're sending an email, you're just hammering it out and bang, <laughs> and if it's no good, I'll write another one to make the point that I'd forgotten I hadn't made, you know. But then when you when you wrote letters, you did sit and think about it first and compose what you were going to say. It is amazing. The, one of the letters I looked at, actually, it contains the word ascertain. Yeah. No, people don't use the word. Lawyers use the word ascertain. You know, people, yeah. people seeking to be precise use that word. Um, you don't imagine Eric Clapton using it. You really no. don't. But anyway, so he works up this song, which is kind of downbeat, really, uh, and is, is only changed when Dwayne Allman comes along uh, to join Derek and the Dominoes. And uh, it's at that point that it acquires the, the thing that makes it still memorable to this day, which is da la da la da. It's a riff, isn't it? It's a it's a lick, you know. It's brilliantly done. I think there's a you know loads of learned um, investigations into into the actual derivation of that lick. Some people trace it to an Albert King track from the late sixties. Some people, Lucas Ayer showed me this uh, this week, um, uh, trace it to the Everly Brothers version of Walk in the Dog from their album uh, Beat and Soul, I think it's called, from 1965, where James Burton, in the second guitar break, you can go and listen to this on Spotify if you want to, uh, the Everly Brothers version of Walk in the Dog, that's where that riff sounds to me to actually... It, to actually it's precisely start precisely the same riff, isn't it? I mean, maybe it was one that a lot of people used to talk because it's just a little warm up in the third b- b- uh, bar of a four bar figure, isn't it, to, to lead up to the start of a new bar? But I mean, may- maybe maybe a lot of people used it, but that is precisely the riff. It and is, it and the interesting pop fact was that wasn't wasn't Jim Gordon playing? Jim the drums Gordon on actually that played track? drums on that session. And the bit that's put on the end of Layla for for no good reason, really, was which is that kind of piano instrumental, which Jim Gordon, the late now late Jim Gordon, uh, claims to have written. Uh, which apparently, according to Rita Coolidge and her autobiography, is something that she wrote with him when he was her partner, uh, and that, that then turned up on that on that record. And according to Bobby Whitlock, who sang on that record, the only reason it was put on there was that Jim Gordon used to grouse about having no publishing share of Eric Clapton's records. So Eric just gave him that bit, said, all right, you can put that on the end of the record. To keep the peace, didn't he? That was the whole keep thing. Keep the peace. So years later, Jim Gordon, complex psychiatric history, you know, which we talked about in, in recent in recent podcasts. There's an excellent book about it. Um, and he he 
went was in, eventually incarcerated for killing his mother. There is nothing the story lacks. Absolutely oh. nothing the story lacks. Uh, and so the royalties end up going to his daughter. Layla, at the time it first comes out, it's a flop because nobody knows who Derek and the Dominoes are because he's decided he's not going to be Eric any longer. You know, he's just going to hide behind this uh, this band name with the result that the record utterly flops, but slowly becomes an enormous hit through FM radio and compilation albums and all kinds of things. You can't imagine how much money Layla must have made over the years and how little of it really is owed to what Eric Clapton did, really. You know, it's what loads of other well, people. Well, it's all the that, other people who transformed it. It was Dwayne Allman changing yes. the pace of it and yeah. having that lick, wasn't it? It was, uh, you know, the the bit written by Rita Coolidge for which she never got any yeah. credit. Um, so many factors, and then the and then the thing that makes it the biggest hit of all. Many years later, decades later, unplugged. Eric Clapton does Unplugged and is persuaded to do a kind of downbeat, acoustic, coffee shop it's version sort of, of Layla. Kale version, isn't it? Yeah. Which is the biggest hit of his entire career. And, of course, doesn't have the piano bit at the end, but, you know, Jim Gordon will still have uh, benefited from it, you know, because that's the way the publishing works. And it just strikes me, you look at the whole story, you think how ridiculous it is that that within the traditions of the music business, the writer gets the lion's share in what is actually a massively cooperative industry. Absolutely all kinds of people are, are piling in all the time. Well, there have been various cases, haven't there, where people whose who's signature, the violin on Young at Heart with Bobby Valentino, big court case, wasn't it? Because without that signature... It, it, it isn't quite the same song, so they're very difficult things to uh, to thrash out. No, but you know the way the way it's gone, you know, in the last forty, fifty years, and you, know, you wonder whether it's tenable in the future. Is that you know the person who who gets the benefit is the person who somehow had their credit on it way back in the day, way back in the mists of history. And, of course, you know, there's, there's Layla, Layla all these years later. You know, what did we say? 50-some years later, still playing a major part in the lives of all kinds of people. And on that note, we'll be back. This is a junction in the Word podcast. It separates that bit from this next bit. So this week in 1965, Bob Dylan released Bringing It All Back Home, uh, which was remarkable in, num- in a number of ways. Obviously, it, uh, it had one side acoustic and one side electric, so it was a bit of a transitional record. Uh, but also, one of the things that makes it live so much in the public imagination was the cover. And if you can't remember what the cover looked like, it had Bob Dylan in a kind of upscale uh, bohemian domestic environment in a rather nice house, rather well-dressed. He's got a, got a grey cat on his knee, and he's surrounded by records and magazines and books and so forth. But in the background, looking what I used to refer to as drop-dead gorgeous, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, Sally Grossman, who was the wife of his then-manager, Albert Grossman, who's uh, wearing a very striking red outfit and uh, and smoking a cigarette like something off uh, of an advert you might have found in life magazine back in the days and it was it, it was um a cover that seemed to bristle with signals didn't it mark oh it was so it was extraordinary dave it was um it, it was a a kind of post folk music positioning statement in in that before that he'd been this bloke in a kind of old battered old leather jacket with acoustic guitar, and he was trying to signify that he was something different. And also, the myth, so much mystery, because it wasn't explained. It wasn't like that was an official picture put out. There was no indication as to what was going on or who the person was. I mean, you always imagine, the young teenage me imagined that must be his girlfriend. Um, you know, there were there were things on there. There was uh, there was LPs by The Impressions. Wasn't there? there was a Robert Johnson album. There was a Ravi Shankar album. Which is very extraordinary because this was, I don't know, March 65 and the Beatles didn't start doing, you know, Nor- Norwegian Wood didn't come out till till uh, December 65. 
Do you know how that stuff, uh, uh, all those those elements ended up there? I was looking into this. The picture taken by Daniel Kramer, and um, it was taken at Albert Grossman's house in uh, in Woodstock, and um, the record company they they only said one thing, which is it's got to have a girl in it. Oh, really? Is yes. That their idea? Yes. Now, which you can well imagine, actually, because the previous albums, apart from Fri- they probably looked at the previous albums. First album, he's, he's wearing a kind of he we looking like, like freewheeling Woody. Bob Dylan. Let's do that again. He, he was looking like Woody Guthrie. Yeah. And freewheeling Bob Dylan had famously had Susan Rotolo, and that did really well. And then he had uh, Times the Hour of Changing, where he, he looks like a kind of migrant from Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, and then another side of Bob Dylan, where he kind of looked like nothing, really, particularly. And they thought, the, the one that's done best is the one with the girl. Let's have a girl. Again. Let's have a girl. And so he didn't want his girlfriend, if he had a girlfriend at the time, to do it. So he just said, Sally Grasman, would you do it? So she did it. And apparently she wore that dress there and never wore it again. She only, she only died a year or so ago, didn't she, Sally Grossman? And all I'm the elements... it must have been sold off at auction by no, I don't think so. I don't think so. And all the elements in the picture were just gathered... By Bob Dylan and Daniel Kramer from Albert Grossman's house at the time, you know. So it's got Impressions album. It's got King of the Delta Blues singers. It's got Lottie Lenya. The Francois Hardy albums. You can't quite see on the on the thing, but in the in the in the, in the outtakes, you can see that it was there. Yeah, yeah. So they were just kind of gathered in the day. But I do think it was interesting that they they thought it ought to have a, a woman in it. And also the other interesting thing, and I think you touched on it there. It's indoors. Whereas yeah. the previous ones didn't either weren't indoors or didn't look indoors. So suddenly he's at home. He's got things. You know what I mean? He's yeah. wearing nice things. He's got flashy cufflinks and so forth. He looks kind of settled. You know, that was the that was a subliminal message, wasn't it? At the yeah, time? it was. But the other thing is that 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 traditionally record co- uh, covers never had any, I suppose, what you might call context. No. You know, they were simply the photograph of the star, or they were a, later on a kind of hypnosis type image, which is an art image uh, meant to kind of add to the value of the whole package. But they weren't they weren't contextual. They didn't give you any indication of the lives that these people lived. No, and that's an interesting. That's a whole a whole thread, I think, of album covers. There were a particular spate of album covers which basically said, "Here's you know here's here's my girlfriend," wasn't there? Yeah. Paul Simon, you know. Um, Paul Simon's songbook, which had Kathy from Brentwood, um, who was his girlfriend at the time, on, on the cover. Uh, Mandy, was it on the back of Love Chronicles? Mandy, with an I, is on the back of Al yeah. Stewart's Love Chronicles, you know. And Bert Yanches, is, is Bert Yanches, Don't Bother Me, is it? Is bother, it's it? a fantastic sleeve, and he's just looking at the camera in this, I think, sort of bare board kind of garret type thing. And there in the background, this fabulous looking kind of folk girlfriend, you know. And also, I can remember seeing Tupelo Honey and seeing pictures of, of Janet Planet. Yes. Thinking, what has happened to Van Morrison? I remember Van Morrison as a kind of barrel house, slightly thuggish looking member of them. And now he's there wearing a kind of blanket and he's walking through woodland with, with somebody called Janet Planet. You know, it's just absolutely extraordinary. And Sid Donald Marrick, Giles, do you remember that record? With Donald Giles, of course you met. And I met one of the girls on the sleeve of that record the other day. Uh, who was Giles's wife, a girl called Mary Land, and uh, who was 20 at the time. I was still terribly thrilled about it, very proud of it. Oh, really? And that was just a really cool thing. Yes, yeah, so it was just such a cool thing, because there was these two guys who just thought, wow, that's the, that's the powerful aphrodisiac yes. of music. You know? <laughs> that's <laughs> Dressed like that and being members of King Crimson, and you will uh, find uh, gorgeous women will come flocking, you know. And then Sid Barrett's, is it the Matt Cap laughs? Oh, yeah, yeah. And which has... Uh, his then girlfriend, was she called Iggy? Iggy the Eskimo, who I think is wearing no clothes at all. She's sitting on a stool in the background, isn't she? Absolutely amazing. It is. It is. Um, and, of course, so much of this kind of relates to one of the old one of the old kind of functions of an LP. If you look in the early days of the LP, and I wrote about this in my book of fabulous i've got to plug my book of fabulous plug creation away. um in the development of the, of the lp was the projection of an lp as being a thing that essentially belonged in a kind of bachelor's lair you know what I mean? it was 
come back and listen to my LP, you know, that yeah. kind of idea. And so many of the of the LPs of the early 60s featured um, you know, models in, uh, in negligees or whatever, you know, curling up on a sofa preparatory to listening to the latest album by so-and-so, you know. Yeah. So this... The idea you presented the artist in this way was a little bit of a, a reflection of, of that way of doing things, wasn't it? And then you start getting that period at the, in the late 60s and the early 70s where bands start to be photographed in what I think they would probably have described at the time as their pads, surrounded by the detritus of their lives. I think you've got a soft machine I found album a really there. good version of this, which came out when I was about 15, which is Soft Machine Third. And the big inner gatefold of this has the four members of the group, Elton Dean and Hugh Hopper and Mike Ratledge and, and Robert Wyatt, just sitting around in a flat. And it's, compl- what, you know, what I loved about it was at the time was that up till then you felt the pictures were very posed. And here we are, we're looking at the camera, we're, we're trying to, this is just a snap. So a snap, no one, one of them is looking at the camera. They're sitting around in this fantastically uncomfortable looking flat with no furniture in it on the floor, surrounded by just detritus, just, you know, uh, empty plates with forks on them, uh, teapots, empty bottles of wine, wine glasses, uh, old biscuits. There's a mandolin, there's some bongos, there's an electric guitar. And, I mean... There was something I found very exciting about that. I don't know why. It was something about the adult world. People living in their own flats. You know, yeah, the, 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 the basic message was our mum is not here. You our mum is not here. <laughs> we haven't done the washing up. Absolutely. <laughs> because that is the great truth. I can, I can remember it so well myself when I first lived in a flat. Should we do the washing yeah. up? No, we'll leave it till tomorrow. <laughs> Who <laughs> cares? <laughs> And then within three days, the place was just completely unlivable. <laughs> I've got, I've got one I've got a scene in Withnail where they look at the undone washing up and say, "We'll go in together. We'll go in together in the morning." <laughs> There's something living in there. <laughs> <laughs> I've been sent one uh, by Stuart Penny, who's been going through his old album covers, looking for examples of this kind of thing. And he sent me a, a picture of man's album, Rhinos, Winos and Lunatics, which That's is fantastic a cover. fantastic example of the, the kind of thing. Because I think I think one member's reading a p- copy of Penthouse. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it's a bit like the soft machine thing. It's kind of bohemian squalor in a way. Yes, it but is. the details are so brilliant. In the background of the man uh, picture, there's a bookcase which we all had at that time, which is made up of bricks and planks. Yes. <laughs> And you know, and it's just the carpet. Everyone's sitting on the carpet, kind of cross-legged. There's no furniture. <laughs> there's a Welsh flag. I think there's a Quicksilver Messenger album. Yes, there there. is. There is. Yeah, the copy of Pentas is a classic example. Again, yeah, we're we're not with the parents anymore. We got (laughs) Pentas. I think he's also he also sent me um, Paul Paul Kossoff's Backstreet Crawler. Oh, another good one album. Uh, On the back of that, he's 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 featured in in his in his flat uh, just off Langbrook Grove at the time. Basically, you're flicking flicking V's at the camera, obviously, because that's what you had to do. Yeah. Um, but um, surrounded by posters and um, and hi-fi, you know what I mean, uh, such as we would have found immensely enviable back in those days. You, you used to think, look at that picture. Look at the size of his speakers. You know? Yes. That was incredibly important to be. Uh, ashtrays and kit. Yes. <laughs> Ashtrays, that's the other feature of photographs, genuine photographs from those days, which you no longer see. And if anybody tried to replicate those days, they wouldn't dare include. And that is the great sign that you're in the, in the early 70s is the overflowing ashtray. It is. They're genuinely yeah. overflowing ashtray. It's a sight. The very thought of it turns my stomach nowadays. It's the smell of <laughs> ashtrays. Oh. God. You kind of, you, you eventually fall asleep on a scatter cushion, wake up, you know, with your head virtually in an ashtray with a huge bottle of red wine <laughs> nearby, half drunk. Oh, God. And a record, still on the record player, we go click, click, click. 
thinking, what? What's happened? What a terror. I'll never do that again. That's the oh, real no. 70s kids. Oh, no. The Word Podcast. Two cocoa tins and a piece of string. And we're back with Alex Gold. Say hello, Alex. Hello, Alex. And uh, some readers' correspondence. Uh, we were talking in recent weeks about bands who might have been held back by inappropriate names. And uh, Peter Nuttall wonders if we're familiar with upcoming indie band Animal Shithouse. <laughs> because their new <laughs> EP is entitled House of Shit. <laughs> and they come from Royal Tunbridge Wells. Of course well, they do. Well, Peter, we were not familiar with them previously, but we are now, as is the whole nation. Yep. Nay, the world. Um, Unlikely so, to be hearing them on any radio station, are you? But there we are. <laughs> there you are. There Shoot you are. yourself in the foot technique. Yes. It? So um, we got some new patron supporters, haven't we, Alex? And we always like to welcome them. We have indeed. Um, first of all, there's Roger Bentley. Roger Bentley, which made me think, made me recall a, a rich strand of humour back in the days of the word office, where you turn people's names into nouns and verbs. Is that is that Go, right, you Mike? remember, yes. Bill Withers. <laughs> yeah. Tom Waits. Tom, <laughs> Tom Waits permanently standing at a bus stop, wasn't it? <laughs> And Roy Rogers, in fact, wasn't it? Roy Rogers. I can remember. I remember David Essex. He used, always used to do that gag. He say, and, "And Roy Rogers doesn't everyone?" <laughs> <laughs> and who else have we got, uh, Alex? We've got Dan Harrison. Dan Harrison. Interesting pop fact. Um, there used to be a guy called Don Harrison, American rock star in the seventies, who, when John Fogerty refused to have anything to do with the other members of Creedence Clearwater Revival. They hired Don Harrison to front the group. You know, doing he was the man who'd given the unenviable job of being the new John Fogerty. Not something you'd wish on your worst enemy, I wouldn't have thought. Anyway, welcome, Dan. Who else, Alex? Chris Young. Chris Young. Uh, nice. To, do we know anything about Chris? Do we know where he comes from or anything like that? We don't, do we? But it's uh, well, welcome nonetheless. Go on. Uh, Tony Law. Tony Law, absolutely. Similarly welcome. Please um, you know, pull up a pull up a scatter cushion and get near to the, the one bar electric fire. Uh, <laughs> Off which we're lighting roll up cigarettes. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes. Drinking birds instant mellow coffee <laughs> while listening to a man album. Yeah. yeah. I'd pop in next door to the off license to get a bottle of old English cider. Um, <laughs> Alex carry on. Roger D. That's Roger, cap- Roger cap- D. just the capital letter. Yeah, dancing think, with dancing with Roger D. Do, do do we think David might be Tenacious D's brother? He might be, or it could be Roger Dean, the sleeve uh, designer, wishing to remain uh, remain anonymous. And I think the next the next one also wishes to remain anonymous. Is that right, Alex? Yeah, this is possibly not their real name. Uh, it's Interactive Internet Interloper. Okay, well, That's a great, great bit of alliteration there. Has to it be said. is very welcome, nonetheless. Absolutely, and finally, and finally, last but not least, Mitch. Mitch, oh, yeah. I like to think that that is uh, Eugene Levy because he plays the part of Mitch, doesn't he? Uh, in uh, in that fine uh, Christopher Guest film, A Mighty, Mighty Wind. Wind. That's a particularly moving thing, isn't it? The the, the 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 pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, the song that they sing. Do you remember when all the bands appear in the wings to see where they kiss at the end of it? Whether they kiss it. Because oh, Mitch, so Mitch is one member of a duo called Mitch and Mickey with Kathleen O'Hara, I think, is the That's right. is it's Mickey. Me. And uh, they're supposed to be some kind of Peter, Paul and Mary or Sonny and Cher type, yeah. type couple. And if you haven't seen A Mighty Wind, go and, you know, correct that um, that um, that problem is uh, that terrible error as soon as possible. Because the great thing about Kiss, Christopher Guest films, as compared to pretty much any humorous films, I'm prepared to go on record as, as saying this. You can watch them again and again and There's again. There's so many little details. You never get tired of them. It, unlike a lot of comedy films where you think, no, I'm laughed out at that, really, you know. The Christopher Guest films, you know, Wedding with Guthman and, and things like that. And, uh, best in show, Spinal Tap, obviously. Uh, a Mighty Wind. You can go back to them again and again. Because most comedy shows are just about 
they're just about telling gags, aren't they? But it's, yeah. it's really about the relationships between the people. That's what's so touching. Yeah, it's wonderful. All the, all the Mighty Wind crew and their relationships, the, the, the government actors, and Spinal Tap and their, their sort of wounded looks at each other when they feel let down. It's, it's very, all it's very yeah. Deep. Well, they, they always say that tragedy is comedy played at a different speed, isn't it? <laughs> you know, it's the, it's the same thing. Anyway, welcome all those people to our uh, Patreon army, and so they'll now be able to uh, take advantage of such things as the Friday night quiz, which is the ideal way to start your weekend. And if you haven't joined us in the past, do make a point to do it. That happens at six o'clock every Friday. Uh, where we get together via Zoom and we present people with 10 visual clues to the identity of um, of a famous or maybe not so famous album. And according to how quickly they manage to decipher that, they may be in for, well, a major prize, isn't that like? A isn't major that right? prize, and, and it's brilliant because people gather from all over the world. They do. Uh, they do. At this particular time, at 6 o'clock UK time, on uh, on uh, on Friday nights, it's very good. And uh, you know, if you win, you can be the proud owner of uh, such trinkets as Alex. What did we give most recently? I think we had a fridge magnet, didn't we? We, did. we had a genuine Hawaiian fridge magnet. <laughs> So there you go. You know, they. Uh, they you what know, more incentive could you possibly need? All this could be yours. Uh, And I think that's it from us this week. Uh, We'll see you next week. See you next week. This podcast was brought to you by The Word. (laughs) 